We have come to the, the climax of the Christmas season. We have come to the, the four Sundays of Advent where we've looked at Christ or God revealing himself ultimately in Christ, but the, the themes of hope and joy and love, and then, of course, last week of peace, where we read with Isaiah where the Prince of Peace would be coming. And then tonight we come to the culmination of that. In our wreath here in the front we have the... The fifth candle, the middle candle, the Christ candle is lit, and that, uh, that is because it signifies the birth of Christ. And that's what we come to celebrate tonight. And we see all of that hope, that love, that joy and peace, all that is prophesied about the coming Savior. We see that come to fruition in a manger in Bethlehem. And so we come to, to hear that and, and celebrate that tonight. We're going to go to a familiar passage in Luke 2, what, what many people refer to as the Christmas story. Luke, as you know, the, is of the four Gospels. He gives the most detail of the actual birth of Jesus. Uh, the other synoptics, Matthew, and uh, Matthew gives a genealogy writing to the Jewish family, and his is, gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ and uh, the generations that come before and all the, the names that are tied to that is some of that we've been studying about in Genesis. And then, of course, Mark's is much, much more brief, as his whole gospel is. It's more brief in the uh, telling of Christ's coming. And John gives a more theological, in John 1, he gives a more theological uh, about the word becoming flesh and what that means. And Luke gives a kind of a blow-by-blow blow account in Luke 1 and 2 of Mary being pronounced that she is going to have a child, being a virgin, and then the angel appearing to Joseph and revealing this to him. And then they, they proceed in their engagement and their uh, betrothal that they, they're going to be married, even though there were many questions about it from the townspeople. But this was the virgin that was going, that God had prophesied so many hundreds of years before through Isaiah that was coming and that would be the Christ child. And so we see this in Luke 2. Luke, of course, was the, the physician, so he, he gives a lot of attention to this event. But he also was a historian and, and sat with Mary and others and interviewed them. That's how he wrote his gospel. And so this is, we, we get a very detailed event, these first 14 verses. So if you would follow along with me in Luke 2, very familiar passage, just a, almost a poetic passage now, the way we have heard it so many times, and it's, it just brings to light the beauty of this season. Luke 2, verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. If you will join me in prayer as we lift this passage and, and this part of our worship up tonight to God and ask for his intervention and his direction. Father, we thank you for the, the holiness of your word, the rightness, the rightness of it, the correctness of it, 
And God, I pray that even in these next few moments as we look at this, this narrative, this historical narrative that you have written down, that you have given to your servant Luke, and that he wrote down, God, and that you have kept it right and holy all these years and will for eternity because it's your word, God. I pray that even though it's very familiar, that there are great parts of this, maybe all of it, that many here tonight could recite from memory because they've heard it so many times. Lord, I pray that the message, the truth of this, of this story, of this account, that we will not miss it that we will not miss the glory that is in it, God, just because we're familiar with it. I pray, God, that it, it, will, it will be new and fresh to us, not in meaning something else, but that the true meaning of this passage will bring us great hope, that we will know of your great love, that we will know, Father, that you have sent the Prince of Peace the mighty God, the wonderful counsel, the everlasting Father. And in that, and in that only is our hope in this life and forevermore, that we will know the true meaning of the gospel through hearing this tonight. We pray this in the name of that Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Amen. We look and, and we see in this passage, as we do through just about all of God's word, the great difference, the, the how diametrically opposed the things that God values and the things that the world values. There, there's such a great difference. We see that in this season, do we not? The things that, that the world puts out there for us to celebrate and enjoy have little or in most cases nothing to do with the birth of Christ. They're about a secular message that they have just taking a holiday that has been a celebration that the tradition of the church has been to celebrate Christ, the birth of Christ, and they've taken it for their own celebration for whatever they want to celebrate. It's just another chance to have a holiday and to do what they, when I say they, I'm speaking of the world, the ones that are in opposition to God, the ones that are in rebellion still against God. But we see three, especially, there's several, but in just passage, we see three things, three evidences of how God values things differently than the world does, how he values things differently. We see in those first five verses the actual birth, and we, we see how it is set up, the birth of Jesus. And we can go back to the Old Testament, to the prophets, and to the Psalms even, and see where this has been prophesied. This was not an accident. It wasn't like Mary and Joseph got caught in a bad position, in a bad place. Although it was at the time, in that, in that specific moment in history, for Mary and Joseph physically and in a human way, it was hard. It was troubling. But it was all part of God's plan. That should be a comfort to us. Those things that seem troubling to us right now, whether it be with family members or loved ones or friends that are struggling right now, whether it be with circumstances in our work, in our profession, whether it be the, just the world situation, we dare not fear and live in a spirit of fear because all of this is part of God's plan. All of this God is bringing His full revelation to light in what is going on in the world each and every day, not just with huge, magnificent events, but in the everyday events of life. And we see this with Jesus' birth. God orchestrates all of this. He uses the Roman government to bring it to pass. They bring a census, a registration, as this translation says, that, that where all the world has to go and be registered. In other words, they've got to be taxed. That was not a good thing. The reason they were being taxed, the reason for the census, was so that the Roman government could take more money. That was the whole purpose of it. So there was nothing, Mary and Joseph knew this, all the Jewish population knew this, all of Judea knew this. They knew that it was not a good thing, and you had to return to your place of your birth. Isn't that unique? As we looked last Sunday in Isaiah, and how, and how we ended with God's covenant with, with David, and that he was of the city of Bethlehem, the city of David, which is Bethlehem, and that far outpost, 
in that place where nothing went on. The tribe, the tribe that was too small, that was too small, and it, it didn't have significance in the world's eyes. It didn't have any significance. And we see that God uses all that. He uses all those factors to bring about his plan. Daryl Bach in his uh, great commentary on, on Luke says this about, about this very incident. Rome was an unconscious agent in God's work. The profane decree of a census had yielded a divine event. A stable was the Messiah's first throne room. And this, it was not just another baby being born, but it was the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the one that had been foretold, the one that had been hoped for, the one that had been waited on, Emmanuel. That's who it was. And again, we see not only the smallness of Bethlehem, the smallness of the city of David, the eighth son of Jesse, the one that was considered insignificant, He wasn't even brought forth for his father when Samuel came to anoint whoever the king was because he was out in the field. It was not even thought that David could be the anointed one, but yet he was. Bethlehem was the chosen city, that small rural outpost. That's what God valued. That's where he put value. And then we see just the birth. We look in our culture today. The birth of a child, Scripture tells us over and over that a child is a blessing. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full, who has a household of children. That goes back to what we've been looking at for so many months and even years now in Genesis, right? The very first command is what? Be fruitful and multiply. But that's not the way the world views children today, is it? They are... They, okay, we can have a couple, but after that it gets to be, it's a, it's a hindrance to my lifestyle. They, they, they're a problem. They're a problem. They're a negative. So much so that now we have, we speak of abortion in our culture as a, a women's health issue. Like it's going to get tested for, for your heart and lungs or something. That is how commonplace It has become because the world does not value what God values. And he makes this. How does it? He could have sent his son any way he wanted to. He could have sent him on a white throne coming down from the clouds, beaming with light, with a crown and a scepter. He could have sent him on a white horse, which he will one day, but coming across the sky. He could, he's God. He could bring his son to earth any way he wanted to. But he chose to send him as a babe in a manger, born of a virgin, but still going through all the facets of life, all the struggles of life, going through the toddler years, going through the the elementary years, going through what we call the teenage years, young adult life, and all the struggles, all the temptations, all of that. God chose to bring his son that way. But yet, he did all of that without sin. That's what made his sacrifice, the reason Jesus Christ came. That's what made it perfect. It was not marred by sin. And he could take on the sin of the world. All of your sin, all of my sin, all of the church's sin forever and ever. And put it on his shoulders. And take the wrath of God, the punishment for that sin. And he was the perfect sacrifice. And there's no more sacrifice needed. What a wonderful way God chose to do that. But he extols the birth of a little baby. A thing that we, in in many places in our culture today, that is seen as a negative. Or it's not seen as important. Or it is seen as a trial coming on a family. Oh my goodness, they're having a child. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to nurture it and take care of it and hopefully train up a disciple of Jesus Christ. That was the whole purpose, the plan from the beginning. So we see the, how God puts value on insignificant events where other people, where the world doesn't do that. Next, we see his value of lowly places. We've already talked about this with Bethlehem of sorts in verses 8 through 12. Who does God choose to make the announcement to? He didn't call up the newspaper and put it in the Woodruff News or the Spartanburg Herald or the Greenville News or even the state paper. Who did he send it to? 
He sent the announcement to the shepherds, the lowest of the low, the ones that sat out all night in the cold or in the heat who had to fight off wolves and bears that came to try to take their, take their sheep and eat them. And they, they were out there. It was a lonely job. It was a constant job. It was one of a caretaker. Interestingly enough, it is what God calls his pastors that he calls to shepherd his people as under shepherds in the church. He doesn't call for celebrity shepherds. He calls for shepherds that do the dirty work and smell like sheep. That's what a pastor is to be. And this is who God appears to in verse 8. In the same region, that outpost, that small rural place, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Is that not the case with every time we see the glory of God? They were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them what? What the angel always said, what he said to Mary, what he said to uh, Joseph, he said, fear not, fear not, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior that is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. In other words, this is how you know it's him. There'll be a babe in a manger, not in a crib, not in a cradle, not in a, a room that's taken care of, but in a cave because there was nowhere else for him to happen because the birth suddenly came upon Mary. And he's put where, where cattle are fed in a manger and wrapped up in swaddling cloth, and that will be your sign, and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest, and on earth, Peace among those with whom he is pleased. We see this, this lowly, gentle nature. We see the lowest of the low, the shepherds. They had no standing in society. They weren't businessmen. They weren't of good repute. They, didn't, they weren't thought well of. They weren't sought after. Pastors didn't go bring them into their church so they could fill their coffers full and they could build new buildings. That was not the place of shepherds. They were the low of the low that worked out in the dirty fields with dirty sheep every day, nonstop. And that's who God chose to make the announcement of the Messiah in all of history, Jesus Christ to all the world. He told the shepherds first. He told the shepherds first, and the angels appeared to them. We see this is very much the nature of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And something we'll be talking about in the coming year on a Wednesday night study. But in in Matthew 11, verse 29, the only place, the only place in Scripture where Jesus' heart is described, the only place in Scripture, Matthew 11, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. I am gentle and lowly in heart. That is the grown man, Jesus Christ, that once was the babe in the manger. He didn't say, I'm strong and mighty and I can do anything I want to do, which is very true of him, but he said, I'm gentle and lowly in heart. We see this in Matthew, in, in just before that, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 5. He said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The lowly, those are the ones the lowly in heart, that don't think well of themselves, that are not boisting themselves up, that aren't worried about their profile on social media, that aren't worried about the accolades that they're getting. And I couldn't help but think about how this applies to to God's under-shepherds, pastors. So So much in the church world is so much competition from one to another to try to outdo the other to try pastors striving for a bigger platform so they can be world-renowned rather than shepherding the flock that God has entrusted to them. That's scriptural from the pastoral epistles. And so we see how much value God puts on the lowly things of life, the things that we disregard, the things that that we don't pursue, that we don't think are important. And lastly, 
we see, as we've already read, the value of peace. That's, that is valued by the world, but we, the world doesn't understand where peace comes from. Peace is not everything being okay, because guess what? Not for the born again or those who have not been born again, this world is not peaceful. If we're depending on circumstances, we're not going to have any peace, folks. I lived a lot of my, uh, even my adult life in that way. I can remember even as a little boy, especially around Christmas time, I wanted to get everything just right. I wanted to get everything, I wanted to get all my chores done. I wanted to get everything done and I wanted to get everything fixed. If I had to get my room clean and I re- and and mom and daddy were really going to check it. I had to pull out all the junk from my hiding places. I wanted to get all that done. And I wanted everything to be okay. But you know what? Nothing's ever going to be okay. Because we live in a fallen world. And sin affects our creation. It, it, it brings tornadoes. It brings hurricanes. It affects relationships. It affects the brokenness in our life. Even if we've been redeemed, we still struggle with our sin. Y'all know this and I know this. But God values peace. The world values peace, but the world puts a much higher premium on accolades and stirring something up. We We try to live life one while to the next. What big event's coming? What big, what's coming up next? What, what, what do I need to get ready for? What can I get ready for? Where will there be excitement? Where, where's there going to be something? that? When, when's that big game coming? When's that vacation coming? When's this? When's this? When's this? The church has adopted that. We, 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 we many times catch ourselves, if we're not careful, all our energy and all our resources go toward events and trying to, to drum up a big event that has very little with growing, had to do with growing people in Christ. Many people have spent time, Danita and I kind of halfway joked about this the other night in a conversation, but I can remember times where I've been part of a situation where as a young child or even as a young adult, where Christmas time meant a bunch of plays and a bunch of dramas and all the time and effort that went into manger scenes, nativity scenes, and trying to make sure my baby was highlighted and my little girl got attention and my little boy got attention. And it had nothing, it was all about a performance of humans. It had nothing to do about the glory of God. We spend so much time looking for the big wow. And God values peace. God is the author of peace. And peace, when we know genuine peace in Jesus Christ, where we can have peace not like the world gives, but only God gives in a relationship, in a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing like that, folks. You know that, and I know that, but in this world, in this culture, it's very hard to remember that because there's so many things pulling at us. Remember what the angel said here. We just read it. I'm going to read it again. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Some some translations read that differently, meaning peace to all mankind. But a more literal translation is peace with whom God is pleased. Who is God pleased with? Is this a works-based salvation that the little babe in the manger is coming to make sure we earn our salvation? No. God is pleased with us when He awakens us to the gospel and we repent and we believe that gospel and we submit to His Lordship. We don't do everything perfectly. But in that time that we're born again, in that time that we're born again, our desires change, do they not? Scripture tells us that. Our desires become about the things that God values, not that the world's value. All that changes differently for each of us. Some it happens very quickly. Some it's much more of a struggle like myself. But we grow the more we read God's Word, the more we read about His revelation, the more we read about who He is and and His attributes 
and what he loves, then we desire those same things more than what the, the things of the world. And it is a process, and it is done by pouring into each other, but it is mainly done by God's word coming alive in us. John tells us this, here's, here's why God is not putting everyone at peace instantly. Because God is not going to devalue who he is or what he is giving. He is given the free gift of salvation. And if it is not received, if it is not embraced, God is not going to be at peace with those people. He is not going to be reconciled with those people as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. That's when we are at peace, when we are reconciled with God. Because God's not going to devalue the qualification for salvation, which is what? His righteousness. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sake He made Him who knew no sin to become sin, so that through Him we might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange on the cross. Jesus took our sin, the babe in a manger, who grew up to be a man, took our sin and gave us his righteousness and washed us white as snow with the righteousness of God. That's where the peace comes from, folks. John, the, in the Gospel of John, in the first chapter, where he talks about the, the following verse after this, in verse 14, as he became flesh and dwelt among us. But in verse 12, remember in verse 11, it talks about John 1, where, where Christ came and those, his, his own rejected him. His own, the Jewish nation rejected him. And then verse 12 says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Verse 13, Who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. It is a supernatural event where God literally comes and resides in us in the form of the Holy Spirit. That's where peace comes. And that very next verse in John 1, 14, where the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He dwelt among us so that we might know His Father, so that we might know Him and that we might have relationship with Him. That is the beauty of the Christmas story, folks. That is where peace comes from, from the babe lying in a manger. Any of you that have ever had children or been around children or have been around infants, when they're sleeping, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. But when they wake up, it is anything but peaceful. Right? But yet, the peace that God gives, not like the world gives, but the peace that He gives, it is eternal. It is long-lasting. It weathers any storm. It weathers any sickness. It weathers any grief from the loss of a loved one. Whatever trial may come our way, we still can have peace through Jesus Christ, through the babe in a manger. That is the gift of Christmas. That is what we celebrate on this holy night. That God, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Truly our Emmanuel. That was prophesied. He has come to be with us. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you are not like the world. The world has, is broken, Lord. It has been infected by sin. It has destroyed what, what you created to a degree, God. But you are coming. You are going to make all things new. And God, you have begun that process already with the birth of the Messiah, of Jesus the Christ, who was born to the Virgin in the city of David some 2,000 years ago, Lord. And that he is coming to reconcile himself with all the world. He is gathering his church, Lord. Father, I pray that Tonight, on what we celebrate on this birth of Christ, and in a moment as we come to your table and celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of that same Jesus, of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord, that in remembering that and looking forward to his return when he will come again 
in all of his might, all of his power, not in a babe in a manger, but as king of the universe, as the holy righteous one that has conquered the world. And he will come to bring home forever those that he has redeemed. Lord, I pray that we will not lose sight in all our trouble, in all the hurt, in all the tr- problems in our, in our culture, that we will not lose sight of this gift of peace that you have so graciously given us and that will glorify you in our appreciation of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.